Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. When John's writing this to the seven churches, the first one he's writing about, who the first one that grace and peace comes to people, is by whom? In that uh, first bracket. That's right. From him who is, was, and is to come, that is God the Father. Here we see an example, a mentioning of God the Father. And then in the second bullet point, it says, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, that's kind of a tough thing. We see that many times in the Bible, uh, especially in the book of Revelation. And the idea of the seven spirits comes from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Where it says here, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. And the, well, let me go back actually to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, because it says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from the roots, from his roots, will bear fruit. Who's that talking about? Jesus Christ. It's talking about Jesus Christ. So when we know this is talking about Jesus Christ, then we can go on and understand what's going to happen with the Spirit in relation to Jesus. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon Jesus Christ. It says the Spirit of wisdom. That's the second Spirit. The Spirit of understanding, the third Spirit. The Spirit of counsel, the fourth Spirit. And of strength, the fifth Spirit. The Spirit of knowledge and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. So we have seven spirits here that are mentioned as falling upon Jesus Christ. And so it's not unusual when we see the seven spirits mentioned that we're talking about all these aspects of the Holy Spirit that are portrayed in and through Jesus Christ. So when we see the seven spirits who are before his throne, it's just another phrase for whom? The Holy Spirit. So we see God the Father, we see the Holy Spirit, and now we see, who's the third bullet point that we see right here? Jesus Christ. So right here at the beginning of the book of Revelation, we see the whole Trinity together listed, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, all listed together, that are all part of the activity that are going to take place in the book of Revelation. Now, how is Jesus described here? In, uh, we're in verse 6. Uh, well, actually, let me go back. Let's go back to verse 5. Jesus Christ is first described as what? A faithful witness. When he stood before Pontius Pilate, Jesus was faithful. He said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. Jesus was faithful in his death. Jesus was faithful in doing what God had called him to do. So he's the faithful witness. Then it tells us next that he is the what? The firstborn from the dead. That's an interesting statement. We can see it also in Colossians 1, 5, as well as 1 Corinthians 15. What does the firstborn from the dead mean? Okay, he was the first one to rise from the dead. The first fruits as well as the firstborn, opening the door for you and I to be able to rise from the dead and have eternity with Jesus Christ after our resurrection. Then it goes on to say, and he's what? The ruler of the kings of the earth. Well, that's an interesting statement. Is Jesus today the ruler of the earth? Well, that's, that's kind of a trick question. Because God is God, and God is always ruler, and God is always king, and God's in charge of everything. But for a period of time, God has given this earth into the control of the evil one. In 1 John 5, 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Right now, God has relegated this world to the control of Satan, because of the sin that entered the world in Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to see a lot more about that and understand a lot more in the book of Revelation as we go on. 
But we have to understand, God is ultimately the ruler. He is ultimately sovereign. But we're not going to see him come as the king of kings and lord of lords until we walk through this church age that we're in now and until Jesus Christ returns as the ruler of this world. Now he's also described, uh, let's see, after it says that he's the ruler of this earth, it says, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Now, what does that statement say to you? That is one of the more important statements in the book of Revelation. And I think it gets glossed over. I think people forget what it says or don't pay attention. But what does it say to you? What does it say to you personally? Hey, Jesus Christ died for our sins. He died. He's the redeemer. He's the one who justified us just as if I'd never sinned. By his redemption, his blood on the cross. And because of that, he is the only one who is worthy to open the scroll seals that we're going to see in Revelation chapter 5. Then it goes on to say, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not a priest. I don't wear a black robe, but I'm female, so that's not likely going to happen in the Catholic Church or the Greek Orthodox or some other churches. So what does it mean to say that we are a priest, that we serve him? Each one of us will be a priest. We're told in the book of Revelation, I'll just take you there for a moment, in chapter 20, it tells us in verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And that's not the only place. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we're told in verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, if you read that verse and listen to it, we are priests, each one of us. And not just priests, but we're a holy nation. Now, this is a quote out of the Old Testament. He's talking about the Jews. And yet, he's reiterating it in the New Testament to the church. So we're priests. And the reason we are so that we can proclaim the excellencies of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can be the ones who come before his throne all the time like the priest did. Anytime you and I have access to the throne of God, we can come before his throne just like the priests of old did. That's pretty encouraging. And he tells us right here that we are priests to him. And how long are we priests for him? Forever and ever. How long is that? Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You know, there is no end. Absolutely no end. Now, I choose to be a priest in the kingdom of God rather than the consequences that we're going to see in the book of Revelation that come upon those people who are not priests. How about you? Which side are you going to choose? That's a decision you're going to have to make as you study the book of Revelation. Let's continue now by reading Revelation 1, 7 and 8. Because here it tells us about Jesus, that's who we've just been talking about. Behold, he's coming what? With the clouds. And who's going to see him? Every eye will see them. Okay, now is that because of CNN? Or do you think that's going to be a miraculous undertaking? Uh, a miraculous, yes. Now CNN could do it, but... If everybody in the whole earth at the same time is going to see him, it has to be a miraculous undertaking. I just can't even imagine. Every time when my kids were little, when we'd see clouds in the sky, i go, oh, Jesus might come right now. Of course, he could come on a clear day and just bring clouds with him. So. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's fun to anticipate. He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will what? mourn. Now that sounds weird. Why wouldn't they rejoice like I'm going to rejoice? Why wouldn't they? Because 
The ones who will mourn are the ones who didn't believe in Jesus, didn't receive him as their Lord, as their Savior, as their Redeemer. And they're going to mourn. So it is to be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, that's an, let's go back to look at Matthew 24. In Jesus' own words in the Olivet Discourse, he uses almost the exact same language that John uses here. When he's talking about his return, he tells us in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will do what? Mourn, just like we saw in Revelation. And they will see the Son of Man coming, how? On the clouds of the sky with what? power and great glory and when that happens it says he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other so i'm looking forward to that time but i've made a decision to follow jesus christ as my lord and savior how about you if you are one who has not committed your life to jesus christ if you are what the Bible would call an unbeliever. You can't look forward to that. You'll mourn when Jesus comes because you won't be going with him. That's not going to be a pretty picture. During the time as we study this book of Revelation, I hope that that's something that you will contemplate. All right, now let's move on to verse 9. We are in Revelation 1, 9 here. And it says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the isle called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So what do we learn about John here? He has persevered through tribulation. Now, Paul is very clear in his writings, the kinds of tribulation that he's gone through. John doesn't talk about that in his writings. But as I mentioned before, we know from Fox's Book of Martyrs and other history books about John, the kind of tribulation he went through in life. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and not expect tough times. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus says in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 21, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow. For you to follow in his steps. So if Jesus suffered and he left you an example of suffering, do you think you're going to suffer? Yeah, I think so. Because why? Why are we going to suffer? Instead of telling you why, let me ask you why. Why are we going to suffer? Because of sin. We will suffer because of our sin. There's consequences to sin. Death, health issues, those are all consequences to sin, not something that God had originally planned when he created mankind. What are some other thoughts, other reasons why we suffer? To bring us closer to him. That sounds really strange, but in Deuteronomy 8.2, God says that he tests us to see what's in our hearts. And he does it because he wants to grow us. He wants to oh, rub off the imperfections in our life, the dross. He kind of wants to shape the coal into a perfect diamond. And that doesn't happen without pressure, without change, without tribulation. That's what he wants to do because he, he wants to test us. He wants to know what's in our hearts and he wants to shape us and discipline us so we'll be more like Jesus Christ. That's it. So there's, there's persecution for many reasons in the world. Sometimes it's a consequence to sin, uh, not just sin overall, but we make mistakes and when we do, we suffer the consequences for it. And sometimes we suffer the consequences for other people's mistakes. But we do have tribulation. Mainly, however, what we're talking about here in the tribulations, which is, by the way, the th word thalipsis in the Greek means it's a crushing. It's a pressing. It means experiencing, affl experiencing affliction or distress that is worse than your normal affliction. That's what John is going through here. And the reason he's going through it is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says people love the world. 
A lot of times people don't like us talking about Jesus Christ. They don't like us talking about sin. They don't like us talking about what Jesus calls us to do or how he calls us to live. And so they persecute us. It's kind of like shoot the messenger, <laughs> kind of an idea. And they persecute us. And that's certainly what they did to Paul throughout his writings. That's certainly what they did to the other apostles. So John has experienced that tribulation. It says here that he is a fellow partaker of the tribulation and of the kingdom. When you think of kingdom, what do you think of? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that we're looking forward to. The royal dominion the, those believers who have believed in Jesus Christ will experience. And we're going to see that in the last two chapters in the book of Revelation. That's going to be exciting. You're going to want to sit through the class all the way to the end to read about that. And then it talks about his perseverance. Hupomone in the Greek. That's an interesting word that we see a lot. Perseverance means a steadfast endurance, abiding under. Hupo always means under in the Greek language. And this, in this case, it's abiding under God, Jesus Christ. That's what we are to do. We're to abide under him. Because everything that he's experienced, he goes on to say, is, it's in Jesus Christ. It's all in Jesus Christ. Now, who would want to become a Christian if they know they're going to go through trials? I mean, would you choose that? No. Because we kind of like to say, oh, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and it's going to be a rose garden. <laughs> well, it's all relative. After decades of walking with Jesus Christ, I can tell you I wouldn't change a minute of it. Now, but at the time, it didn't seem to be too fun until I look back and see what God was doing in my life to shape me, to cause me to be more like him because my flesh wants to go in the opposite direction of God. And so he has to shape me and mold me. And every opportunity of growth he gave me was for that reason, to trust in him. So tribulation, as we think of it being bad, it's really not. It's, you know... It's not the problem that God cares about as much as it is how we respond to it. Because we all have problems, and we're always going to have problems. It's how we deal with them. Do we go to the phone or do we go to God? Do we complain or do we pray? You know, it's our decision as to what we do with our problems. Most people get mad. Actually, you know what most people do with their problems? A couple of things they do. What do you think? What do most people do when they run into problems? Complain. They absolutely complain. This shouldn't be happening to me. Well, if you read the Bible, we don't deserve anything. We all deserve hell. So anything good that happens is what we should be blessed with, not concerned about things that happen bad. What are some other reasons? Well, a lot of us uh, blame. I mean, what did Adam and Eve do in the Garden of Eden when, they, when sin came into the world? The woman made me eat it. Satan made me do it. I mean, we turn around and we blame other people. I mean, you just look at our politics. You look at the news media. Everybody's blaming somebody else for everything that goes on. Rarely do you see somebody take responsibility for their own actions. And then another reason why, one of the other things that we do is we run away. When we have problems, we run away from our marriages. We run away from our churches. We run away from our jobs. We just get rid of them and go in a different direction. Those are some of the things we do when we have tribulation. God wants us to go to him first and foremost. He might have us in the midst of that bad job or bad church or bad legal situation or whatever we're struggling with. He might have us there because he sees some character flaws in us that need to be changed. So if we just run away, we're just taking those flaws to a different place. We're not dealing with them ourselves. Someone was telling me of a church not long ago that flourished. When it started, uh, it flourished, grew up into a mega church in a matter of, a, well, a year or two. And you know what? Within a couple years, it fell flat on its face because the church started out from complaining people who were disgruntled at other churches, and they never dealt with their issues, and they brought those attitudes to this new church. And guess what? There was complete, they weren't happy at the new church either. That's what happens when we don't deal with our issues. All right, now getting back to the book of Revelation, it tells us right here in verse 9 where John was. And where was he? 
the Isle of Patmos. And where is Patmos? It's in Greece. It's, it's an island in Greece. So I want to show you here some of the information that we have on Patmos. It, it's an island that is about a, an hour and a half to two hour ferry ride from the western coast of Turkey. So it's just off the coast of Asia Minor. It's not far then from Ephesus, which was the main port city when they would go from Patmos to Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today. Uh, it was called Asia in those times. And Ephesus is where John was the pastor before he was taken to the Isle of Patmos. So it's obvious that they would take him here. Now, Patmos is an interesting island. As you can see as we're coming in here, there's not a lot. What you see there is eh, probably a third to the, of the occupied part of the island. Now you see from up above a little bit of the island too. The island of Patmos is, is a horseshoe-shaped island. It is separated from every other island in that the only way you can get there even today is by ship. They have no airport. They have no helicopters. Well, I suppose a helicopter could probably land, but they, they don't usually go that way. It's by ship. So once November rolls around, you're stuck on the island until the good weather comes back at the end of February, or some middle of February when the ships start running again. So you better make sure you have supplies. And that's in modern day times. So you can imagine what it was like at the time of John. When he was exiled to this beautiful Greek island, which I think, wow, that's not an exile to me. But back then it would have been. Because it gets cold in the winter, they wouldn't have had heat like we have, and they're exiled completely. And this particular place was known for the criminals. So you didn't have a lot of good fellowship on an island like this. Now here you've got a bird's eye view. Where you see right in the middle of that island, it's only 100 yards wide in the middle of this horseshoe shape of the island. There's lots of houses right there on that, which blows me away because I think, huh, if they just have a big wave, it'll hit all those houses and destroy them. Uh, but you get a good idea here of how sparsely populated it even is today because it is so hilly and the terrain is so rough. We see another view of Patmos from up above, again, from coming off the top of the hills. Here we're just coming into the port of Patmos. So you get an idea of the houses right there, and, and it's beautiful. I mean, any Greek island, in my opinion, is beautiful. But you come in and you see this, and the ocean's right in front of them. Not only the ocean, I say, but the sea, the Aegean Sea. It's just gorgeous. The Aegean Sea is absolutely gorgeous. Here you have, up at the top of a hill, what is called the Cave of the Apocalypse. It is here where they believe John actually received the word from God to write the book of Revelation. So, as always, in holy sites, they build a church over it. And there's a church in here. You see many different viewpoints, but you get a little idea of how high up this is when you can see the hill, the other side of the horseshoe, way across the way, and a little bit of the water right below it. This is our group as we're learning all the information about the, uh, the cave and a view from the cave. Again, another view where you see the, the water. Just wanting to give you some uh, visuals of what John experienced. Now, even though he was there in the midst of persecution and dealing with robbers and murderers and other criminals that were on the island, what a great place to be. Now, when you're down below, you can see that monastery up above. It was founded, oh, a thousand years later, more than a thousand years later, by St. Christodulus. So it really doesn't have any biblical significance. But inside there, you can see a, a new Bible. Inside there, you can see an ancient Bible and some ancient relics that were around in the early parts of the beginning of the church. Now, you wouldn't think that driving up to that monastery would be very difficult. I mean, it's just a little hill. You ought to try and drive it. It's, uh, remember that, Nancy? You go around and around and curvy and up and down, and you think you're never going to get to the top. And when you get up to the top, you think, whoa, we are really high up here. Now, with, with that information about Patmos, let's move on to look at Revelation 1, 10 and 11. 
Here John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What does he mean in the spirit? Controlled by the spirit. He was in such a, a state of prayer that it was like he was communing directly with God. And in this case, the power of God was speaking directly to him. Now, I say that in this case, we, it's not just in this case, because we know from 1 Peter, we know from 2 Peter chapter 1, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. And I'm in verses 20 and 21 in 2 Peter 1. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So what this means is that the Bible is inspired by God. God breathed into the hearts of men. So John had to be in the Spirit. He had to be empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to be able to write these things down and say what God wanted him to say. And then he said he was in the Spirit on what day? The Lord's Day. Oh, what, what day is the Lord's Day? Well, we New Testament times have made it Sunday. The first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16 talks about the first day of the week. And in the Jewish culture, which is what the Old Testament was, the first day of the week was always Sunday. So the first day of the week in the Bible times or in any other times is Sunday. And being the Lord's Day is a little differentiation from the Sabbath. So it could be Sunday. It could be Monday. But one, I mean, excuse me, it could be Saturday the Sabbath. But it's probably Sunday, the beginning, what the church is now celebrating as the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. And he said, I heard behind me a what? Loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet. Was it a trumpet? No, it was like a trumpet. We're going to see a lot of likes and as's in the book of Revelation. Those are similes. They mean that this particular thing, in this case the voice, sounded like a trumpet. It had the texture of a trumpet that's how john describes it but it wasn't really a trumpet so when we see similes we have to understand he's using that he's in first century a.d time period trying to explain what's going to happen two thousand plus years later thank you for joining us today on living word ministries with debbie blank living word ministries is a listener supported program we encourage you to visit our website at livingwordministry.org that's www.livingwordministry.org please tune in each week at the same time for living word ministries with debbie blank